the following exhibit developed by the Library and Archives Canada. The reproductions featured here represent remarkable people from all walks of life, regions far and wide, past eras and present day. Some are well known and others should be. All are worth knowing more about. Their portraits and stories reveal tales ranging from assumed identity, exploitation and scandal, to invention, discovery and glorious achievement. The lives of these men and women are certainly worth a second look. Sir John A. Macdonald, Canada's first Prime Minister, was a charismatic leader and legendary risk taker. He led six majority governments and united a country with his national vision and the construction of the world's longest railway. His exploits made him a favorite of voters and cartoonists and critics alike. Macdonald overcame many personal and political hurdles, albeit with the help of the bottle, to lay the foundation for Canadian Confederation. A no-nonsense politician, Jean Chrétien, enjoyed a career in public service that spanned 40 years. The self-proclaimed little guy from Shawinigan rose from humble beginnings to become Canada's Prime Minister for over 10 years. Ever a scrapper, he once put a chokehold on a protester who came too close. In this portrait, the Prime Minister of Parliament gives a Boy Scout salute. A somewhat ironic pose, since Chrétien was kicked out of the Boy Scouts in his youth. Pierre Elliott Trudeau roared into the collective conscience of Canadians when he became the Prime Minister in 1968. Here was a political leader unlike any other the country had ever seen. He flipped the bird, charmed the ladies, and shrugged his way into the Canadian history. Part social visionary and part autocrat, he was responsible for both the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the War Measures Act during his 16 years in office. This photo of then Justice Minister Kim Campbell became one of the most notorious images of a Canadian politician. Many considered the bare-shouldered portrait inappropriate and dubbed Campbell Canada's Madonna in reference to the risque American pop star. The outspoken minister quickly rose through the political ranks and in 1993 became Canada's first and to date only female Prime Minister. Nellie McClung was a novelist, an early advocate of women's rights, and a leader in the prohibition movement in the Western Canada at the turn of the 20th century. By 1916, Manitoba women had become the first in Canada to win the right to vote, one of the famous five who successfully fought for the recognition of women as persons under the Canadian law, McClung was elected to the Legislative Assembly of Alberta in 1921. Goaltender Jacques Plant once said that playing goal was like being shot at. Plant, who led the Montreal Canadiens to six Stanley Cup wins, took action to protect himself. In 1959, he changed the face of professional hockey when he skated onto the ice wearing the first fiberglass mask. Off ice, Plant spent much of his spare time knitting, which he claimed calmed his nerves. When Gilles Villeneuve began his racing career, he was a struggling young mechanic who borrowed some of the tools he needed from a Canadian tire store. After going on to win six Grand Prix races, he repaid the debt with a $9,000 check delivered to the store chain. Unfortunately, Villeneuve's career was cut short when he died at the age of 32 in a crash clocked at the speed of 225 kilometers per hour. The discovery of a life-saving treatment for diabetes earned Frederick Banting the 1923 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. He had also been awarded the Military Cross for his service in the Canadian Armed Medical Corps during the First World War. When another war loomed in Europe, Banting contributed to top-secret research projects on bacterial warfare. He died in a plane crash in Newfoundland in 1941 while carrying his research results to Great Britain. Dr. Norman Bethune was an accomplished surgeon and early proponent of universal health care. Joining the fight against fascism, he served as a medical officer on several war fronts, including the Spanish Civil War, where he devised the first ever mobile blood transfusion service. During the Sino-Japanese War, Chinese Chairman Mao was so impressed with Bethune's efforts on the battlefield that he wrote a tribute to honor him, which is still recited by children throughout China. 
In 1994, Romeo Dallaire took command of the United Nations peacekeeping mission in the midst of a civil war in Rwanda. Without adequate means to intervene, General Dallaire was unable to stop the slaughter of 800,000 people over 100 days. Eventually, he did convince the UN authorities to take action, but it was too little, too late. Appointment to the Senate of Canada in 2005, Dallaire has become a fever and advocate for the victims of genocide. Six-year-old David Suzuki was imprisoned in a Canadian internment camp during the Second World War, even though he was a third-generation Japanese Canadian. He overcame this and other hurdles in his early life and went on to distinguish himself as a geneticist studying the fruit flies and as a broadcaster hosting programs such as CBC's long-running series, The Nature of Things, Suzuki is perhaps best known as one of the planet's most outspoken environmentalists. In 1913, Tom Thompson left his day job as a commercial artist to pursue landscape painting in the wilderness. His art style would later inspire members of the Group of Seven. To supplement his income, Thomas worked as a guide and fire ranger in Algonquin Park. An expert paddler, he disappeared in 1917 on a canoe trip. Although his death was declared accidental, there were signs of foul play. To this day, Thompson's death remains a mystery. Joni Mitchell dropped out of art school in the 1960s to join the folk music circuit. She continued to paint throughout her career, but skyrocketed to stardom with songs such as Big Yellow Taxi, Woodstock, and Both Sides Now. Known for her unique style, Mitchell developed alternate guitar tunings to compensate for a weakened arm due to a paralysis she suffered when she contracted polio at the age of nine. The Dion Quintuplets. In 1934, five identical quintuplets were born in a small Ontario town and miraculously survived. The provincial government placed the babies in a specially built hospital and home known as Quintland, which soon became Canada's biggest tourist attraction. The little girls were put on display for some three million visitors over a nine-year period. In 1999, Ontario awarded the three surviving sisters four million dollars in compensation for their exploitation. Thank you very much for watching this video. Remember, if you like this video, please hit the thumbs up uh, like button. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button and feel free to leave the comments. Thanks again from Fun to Learn Videos.